Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ed Felton. I'm a professor here in the Wilson School and in computer science, and I'm, I'm the director of the Center for Information Technology Policy. And it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Julie Brill. She is a graduate of this fine institution and of NYU Law School. Uh, after a brief period in a big law firm, uh, she went to work for the state of Vermont as the Assistant Attorney General for Consumer Protection and Antitrust. Um, after, uh, after spending a couple of decades there, she moved on to the state of North Carolina, where she was Senior Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Consumer Protection and Antitrust. And so uh, when, the, t when uh, the time came for the President to nominate someone to serve on the Federal Trade Commission, the federal agency that, um, uh, that uh, takes the lead on consumer protection and antitrust, uh, he turned to, uh, uh, to, to Julie Brill. She's been a commissioner at the FTC since 2010. Um, I had the privilege of working with her at the FTC for about a year and a half. Um, and one of the reasons I went there as an academic was to learn about policymaking and how it's done and how it should be done. And in that respect, Julie was a great teacher both in words and, and in actions. I especially admire the work that she's done on privacy, um, uh, which shows intelligence and political savvy uh, and also uh, really, I think, um, uh, reflects Julie keeping her eye on the ball and understanding what is important and what's going to be important for protecting consumers uh, in the new market. And typically, she's been talking about big data and consumer privacy for a long time, um, something which uh, other parts of the government are only now catching up to. Uh, and that will be the topic of her talk today. Please join me in welcoming Julie Brill. Well, it's really, really great to be here. Um, I don't think I've spoken at Princeton uh, since I've graduated. I've spoken many other institutions uh, around the world, and this is probably, um, I I'm most excited to be back home here. Um, and I got a lot of Twitter reactions when I told people I was coming here. A lot of my old colleagues from Princeton tweeted back, homecoming, that's great. So everybody's really excited that I'm here. And, um, th and Ed, thank you for inviting me. Ed was a, um, just a fabulous person for us to work with at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, we have instituted um, a position called Chief Technologist. And uh, it's really an interesting position. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about it during the Q&A. We can talk a little bit about what the Federal Trade Commission does. You can ask me anything you want. I may not be able to answer it, but I'm happy to have you ask anything you want about the Federal Trade Commission, what it was like going through confirmation, what it's like to be a commissioner, what it's like to work with people like Ed. But let me just start off by saying he was absolutely fabulous, and I miss him. Now I'd say every other day. I used to say every day, but I miss him every other day. Okay, so, um, you know, I have been a lifelong consumer uh, protection advocate. I mean, I, I did it for uh, over 20 years in Vermont and then for a brief stint um, in North Carolina, as Ed said. And what I do want to focus on today is something that I have been thinking about for a long time, and that is what I would call the fast growing and most promising area of our technological revolution, and that is big data analytics. And I really want to focus in on some of the consumer privacy issues around that. Around that. So I don't need to tell you all, especially you students, you of the new uh, technological age, that technology is transforming our lives. Its enormous benefits have become a part of our daily routine. TripAdvisor plans our travel. Google Now keeps us on schedule. Birthdays are celebrated on Facebook. And our newborn's, first, newborn's very first pictures appear on Instagram. But these now familiar services are just the beginning of our connected future. Our cars are computers with wheels. Wearable medical devices notify others when we're ill. And our connected refrigerator will soon tell us that we've had a sufficient amount of beer for one night. <laughs> These transformative online and mobile experiences collectively yield an enormous amount of information about each of us. Technology used by others reaps even more data every minute we walk the street, park our cars, or enter a building. 
when we go outside, CCTV and security cameras capture our movements. Some retailers use video surveillance, facial recognition, and cell phone signals to track customers' in-store movements. And every time we go online or use a smartphone or credit card, our purchases and movements are tracked. In a real sense, we are becoming the sum of our digital parts. The estimates of the data we collectively generate are staggering. One estimate, which is already more than two years out of date, suggests that 1.8 trillion gigabytes of data were generated in 2011 alone. So let me tell you what that means. That is the equivalent of every US citizen writing three tweets per minute for 27,000 years. 90% of the world's data from the beginning of time until now was generated over the past two years. And it's estimated that that total will double every two years from now on. This gold mine of data can be put to important, even transformative uses. Now we're going to see how technologically advanced I am. Ooh, excellent. We are all fam familiar with big data's ability to personalize our daily activities, helping companies determine which ads to pitch to us, which newspaper articles to recommend, and which movies should be next in our queue. But big data analytics has loftier goals. It promises to bring us more profound benefits by addressing important societal issues, like keeping kids in high school conserving our natural resources by making use of our electricity more efficient, providing first responders in crises situations with real-time information about the injured or those who lack power, water, or food, and performing miracles in the healthcare sector. Indeed, the opportunities that big data analytics may provide in the field of medicine are staggering. Prevention of infections in premature children. Mobile apps that distribute information to clinicians about bacteria types and resistance patterns in relevant communities. And the <coughs> development of preventive programs that anticipate a person's healthcare status. We are all eager to reap the benefits of big data. Yet consumers, policymakers, and academics also see threats threats from these vast storehouses of data. Most of us have been loath to examine too closely the price that we pay by forfeiting control of our personal data in exchange for the convenience, ease of communication, and fun in a free-ranging and mostly free cyberspace. This examination is becoming all the more urgent as phone, cars, and everyday objects join the Internet of Things. Again, the potential benefits may be profound. Medical wearable devices, for instance, Google's contact lenses that help diabetics track glucose levels in their tears. These wearable devices have the potential to affect millions of people suffering from a wide range of health conditions. But smart devices are about to become always on sources of deeply personal information. This is going to be a big shift for consumers. Instead of having a handful of devices, a smartphone, a laptop, and uh, a tablet, that mainly serve to connect consumers to the internet, consumers may have many devices that they buy for one purpose, making coffee, storing food, getting to work, but that collect and use a vast amount of personal information about them. Whether it's a connected car, home appliance, or wearable device, the data that these, these connected devices are going to generate could be higher in accuracy, quantity, and sensitivity, and if combined with online and offline information about consumers, could have the potential to create alarmingly personal consumer profiles. Will consumers know that connected devices are capable of tracking them in new ways, especially 
especially when many of these devices have no user interface? Will companies that for decades have manufactured appliances and other dumb devices take the steps necessary to keep secure the vast amounts of personal information that their newly smart devices will generate? And how will the new data from all of these connected devices flow into the huge constellation of personal data that already exists about each of us? These questions echo the ones that have long surrounded the vast amount of data collection and profiling performed by ad networks, data brokers, and other entities that consumers generally know nothing about because these entities are not consumer facing. In some instances, these entities track consumers' online behavior. In other instances, these entities merge vast amounts of online and offline information about individuals turn this information into profiles, and market this information for purposes that may fall outside the scope of our current regulatory regime. As we further examine the privacy implications of big data analytics, I believe one of the most troubling practices that we need to address is the collection and use of data, whether generated online or offline, to make sensitive predictions about consumers such as those involving their sexual orientation, health conditions, financial condition, and race. So let's look for a minute at the well-known and by now perhaps even infamous example of targets. Before Target made news for a data security breach that may have affected 110 million consumers' credit cards and debit cards, the company received a lot of attention, at least within the privacy community, about its big data-driven campaign to identify pregnant customers through an analysis of consumers' purchases at its store. It was developing a so-called pregnancy predictor score. Target was able to calculate not only whether a consumer was pregnant, but also when her baby was due. It used the information, Target used the information, to win the expectant mom's loyalty by offering coupons tailored to her stage of pregnancy. Now to be clear, I do not have any information indicating that Target sold its pregnancy predictor score or lists of pregnant customers to third parties, or even that doing so would have violated the law as it currently stands. Yet we can easily imagine a company that could develop algorithms that will predict health conditions, and not just pregnancy, but things like diabetes, cancer, and mental illness, based on store purchases and other seemingly innocuous activities, and sell that information to marketers and to others. And actually, you don't really have to imagine it at all. The US Government Accounting, uh, Accountability Office reports that one data broker includes in its consumer profiles information about 28 or more specific diseases, including cancer, diabetes, clinical depression, and prostate problems. The US Senate Commerce Committee staff describes another data broker that keeps 75,000 data elements about consumers in its system, including the use, the use of yeast infection products, laxatives, and OBGYN services, among much a great deal of other health-related information. And the Wall Street Journal recently informed us that a company analyzes innocuous data from social media and the like to predict disease conditions like diabetes, obesity, and arthritis in order to persuade particular consumers to join medical trials. All of this creation, analysis, and use of consumers' health information is happening outside of HIPAA, outside the US regulatory regime designed to protect health information. Another troubling practice that we need to address, that I believe we need to address, is the creation and sale of profiles to identify financially vulnerable consumers. A number of the consumer lists that data brokers sell carry such titles as rural and barely making it, ethnic second city strugglers, tough start young single parents, and credit crunched 
city families. I am concerned that the names and descriptions of these products, these consumer lists, likely appeal to purveyors of payday loans and other financially risky products to help these salesmen identify vulnerable consumers that are most likely to be in need of quick cash. Now, some would argue that if data brokers aren't employing predictions about health conditions or other sensitive personal information for legally forbidden uses, then what's the harm? These advocates will say that predicting consumers' health conditions could help them reduce their risk of disease or make them aware of new opportunities for clinical trials. And predicting their financial condition could help them find new opportunities for credit, benefits in both instances that might far, far outweigh any breach of privacy. But I believe that this view fails to account for the growing level of concern that consumers have about their most sensitive information being collected and stored in individual profiles and used for purposes that consumers do not know about and have no control over. I believe that we should all be concerned about the use of deeply sensitive personal information to make decisions about consumers outside a legal regime that would provide notice and an opportunity to challenge the accuracy of this data. Similarly, I believe we should all be concerned that, about the risk that such sensitive personal information may fall into the wrong hands through a data breach. But more fundamentally, I believe we should be concerned about the damage that is done to our sense of privacy and autonomy in a society in which information about some of the most sensitive aspects of our lives is available for analysts to examine without our knowledge or consent and for anyone to buy if they're willing to pay the going price. Now these concerns, of course, are not limited to the world of commercial data brokers. We don't have to pass judgment on the revelations about the NSA and other intelligence agencies' data collection and use practices to acknowledge that the recent disclosures have sparked a necessary and, I believe, overdue debate on how to balance national security against citizens' privacy rights. Now, for those of us who have been looking at the issue of privacy in the Internet age for several years, there is a further benefit. Americans are now more aware than ever how much their personal data is free-floating in cyberspace, ripe for any data miner, government or otherwise, commercial or government, to collect, package, use, and on the commercial side, to sell. But with this knowledge comes power, the power to review, this time with eyes wide open, what privacy means or should mean in the age of the internet. I believe that's what President Obama meant in June and again last month when he noted that challenges to our privacy do not come from government alone. Corporations of all sizes and shapes track what you buy, store and analyze our data and use it for commercial purposes. And when President Obama called for a national conversation about the general problem of big data sets because as he said, this is not going to be restricted to government entities. Now, during our ongoing discussion about government surveillance, national security and privacy, leaders within the business community have joined the president in recognizing that rebuilding the trust of individuals is essential to the success of all programs and services, both governmental and commercial, that are built on big data analytics. These business leaders have urged companies to adopt enhanced privacy protections as a key part of strengthening consumer trust. I agree. While I firmly believe that national security issues must be addressed separately from the commercial privacy issues, I also firmly believe that the promise of big data, the huge benefits that we may reap from appropriately tailored use of big data analytics, it will not reach, it will never reach its full potential 
until society addresses some of the key privacy concerns stemming from the creation, collection, and use of sensitive consumer data and profiles. So what I'd like to do is to highlight for you four steps that I believe should be taken by policymakers and industry in the commercial sphere to restore consumer trust and create an ecosystem in which big data can reach its full potential. And importantly, I think that each of you here can play a critical role in helping solve some of these problems. So first, oh, sorry, forgot that one. Okay, first solution, focus on de-identification. We need to encourage companies to de-identify the data they collect whenever feasible. Of course, merely stripping identifiers such as name and addresses is not sufficient. It's too easy to re-identify data. My agency, the Federal Trade Commission, with the help of Professor Felton, has developed best practices around de-identification that I believe strike an appropriate balance and include both robust de-identification technologies and social agreements to not reassociate de-identified data with particular individuals. This means that companies should do everything technically possible to strip their data of identifying markers. They should make a public commitment not to try to re-identify the data. And they should prohibit, contractually prohibit, anyone that they provide this information to downstream, that they sell it to or loan it to or whatever, they should contractually prohibit those entities and individuals from re-identifying the data as well. Robust de-identification along these lines will solve some of the problem, uh, problems relating to big data analytics. And the creation of more effective tools to de-identify data, something I'm confident that many of you in this room could help us develop, would also help. But so, such robust de-identification will not solve the problem of big data profiling. The entire data broker enterprise seeks to develop greater insight into the activities, status, beliefs, and preferences of individuals. The data the industry employs are therefore about or linkable to each of us. So another solution that's been offered to the challenges that big data presents to privacy is the creation of entities that monitor the ethical use of data. One proposal calls for the creation of consumer subject review boards to determine whether particular projects using consumer data are both legal and ethical. Another proposal along these lines, along these lines of ethics, calls for individual companies to appoint algorithmists I can barely say it, but with practice, we'll all get used to it. These are licensed professionals who would have ethical responsibilities for an organization's appropriate handling of consumer data. And I know that Ed Felton's students in Princeton's computer science and engineering programs are encouraged to examine the ethical implications of designing algorithms, cons computer programs, and other innovative projects. More engineering and computer science schools should follow Professor Felton's lead. Yet ethically trained computer scientists, algorithmists, and consumer subject review boards are only going to thrive in firms that thoroughly embrace privacy by design, from the engineers and the programmers all the way up to the C-suite firms that understand the legal and ethical dimensions of the use of algorithms to make decisions about individuals. So, on to the third solution. Changing the law would also help. We have pretty good laws in the U.S. governing commercial privacy, and we have excellent enforcement. The Federal Trade Commission, my agency, which is the leading privacy regulator in the United States, we have built a robust data protection and privacy enforcement program that focuses on the evolving digital and mobile marketplace. The FTC uses its authority to stop unfair or deceptive practices that violate consumers' privacy or place consumers' data at risk. 
We also enforce laws that protect consumers' financial and health information, information about children, and information used to make decisions about credit, insurance, employment, and housing about individuals. We engage in rigorous data security enforcement, as was clear when we just recently announced our 50th data security enforcement action earlier this month. Yet with all of that, I believe we need to improve our commercial privacy laws in the United States. I believe Congress should enact three pieces of legislation <coughs> to help address some of the issues that I'm discussing. First, I think Congress should enact legislation that would require data brokers to provide notice, access, and correction rights to consumers, the rights that would be scaled to the sensitivity and use of the data at issue. Such a law would require data brokers to give consumers the ability to access their information and correct it when it is used for eligibility decisions and the ability to opt out of information that's used for marketing purposes. Thankfully, and as some of you may know, the Senate Commerce Committee Chairman, Rock, uh, Senator Rockefeller, and Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts have in just introduced such a bill. Second, I believe adoption of baseline privacy legislation for the commercial arena would close the gaps in consumer privacy protections that we have here in the United States and help level the playing field among businesses. And third, I think it is increasingly clear that the United States needs federal data security legislation. Now, for those of you here at the Woodrow Wilson School or elsewhere um, within the Princeton community that may be um, interested in these policy issues, we really need your fresh perspectives on how this era of rapid technological change <coughs> has challenged our privacy framework here in the US. And we need your intellect and tenacity to help develop robust solutions like the ones that I've just mentioned. But frankly, I think that we need to address consumers' loss of control over their most private and sensitive information now, even before legislation is enacted. So to this end, I have started an initiative that I call Reclaim Your Name that would give consumers the knowledge and the technological tools to reassert some control over their personal data. Put simply, consumers should have more control over decisions like how much to share, with whom, and for what purpose to reclaim their names. So here's how it would work. Through creation of consumer-friendly online services, Reclaim Your Name would empower the consumer to find out how, how much data brokers are collecting and how they are using her data, give her access to information that data brokers have amassed about her, allow her to opt out if she learns a data broker is selling her information for marketing purposes, and provide her the opportunity to correct errors in information that's used for substantive decisions. Improving the handling of sensitive data is another part of Reclaim Your Name. Data brokers that participate, and this would be a voluntary, self-regulatory program, if you will, data brokers that choose to participate would agree to tailor their data handling and notice and choice tools to the sensitivity of the information at issue. As the data they handle or create becomes more sensitive, relating to health conditions, sexual orientation, financial condition, and the like, for, as just some examples, the data brokers would provide greater transparency and more robust notice and choice to consumers. Now, as you engineers know, the user interface is also critical. It needs to be user-friendly, and industry should provide, in my view, a one-stop shop so consumers can learn about all the tools that data brokers provide and that, and that would give consumers a place where they could go to make choices about how their data would be collected and used. And frankly, I think it's critical that we move beyond a single portal 
um, a single company portal. As some of you may know, one data broker, Axiom, has created a portal for, to allow consumers to have access and some control over some of its data. But because data brokers are exchanging information with one another, consumers need an industry-wide solution that will allow them access across a broader swath of this ecosystem. In sum, Reclaim Your Name would give consumers the power to access online and offline data already collected, exercise some choice over how their data will be used in the commercial sphere, and correct any errors in information being used by those making decisions that could seriously affect consumers' lives. Now you all, you could help develop Reclaim Your Name or similar solutions to bring more transparency to the data broker industry and help enhance consumer privacy. So policymakers, academics, consumer advocates, and business leaders are all encouraging industry to take more aggressive action to protect consumer privacy. Computer scientists, engineers, programmers, and technologists also have a valuable set of skills that should be put to the task of solving some of these critical privacy issues. If we collectively work to implement the steps I've outlined and other steps that you may develop, then I believe we could create an ecosystem that respects consumer privacy and engenders consumer trust, allowing big data to reach its full potential to thrive and benefit us all. Thanks very much. So those are my ideas. So what do you all think? Questions? Discussion? Or as I said, if you want any, you could ask me anything. I just may not be able to answer, but I'm happy to take the questions. Yeah. Uh, so the EU data retention directive usually puts a limit between uh, six months and two years for data retention. Uh, it seems like with your, the, the solutions you're proposing, you're bringing up having consumers have more access to the data collected on them, but it seems like that could just be an easier way of dealing with the solution that companies can't just hold on to your data and squat on it for as long as they possibly can, because the US, it seems like a lot of companies focus on them for operations because it's so much easier to, sto to collect and store data. So are you referring to the EU draft regulation or the current one? Uh, I think mostly the draft one, but as it is still, oh wait, no. Yeah, I think it's actually the current one. So there's been a lot of discussion. Let me first answer that in the US context before I move to the European context. There's been a lot of discussion in the US, especially with respect to do not track solutions or the potential for do not track solutions with respect to retention versus use. And uh, that's that has been a big de debate. I actually think that if we do develop a do not track solution in the United States, which I support and would love to see, that it does need to address collection as well as use. Now, those who've been sort of urging um, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, which is the standard setting body that has been contemplating and working on do not track for some time, those who are urging sort of moving away from the collection um, limitations and into use limitations have also been talking about some retention uh, limitations as well, but um, it's been actually quite problematic here in the United States. Um, so I, you know, do if your question is, you know, do I support retention limitations? Um, you know, what, one of the things that I hear a lot from companies, and I would ask you all what you think, is you know, if we have to delete information after three months, when a consumer comes back to buy another Christmas present for her <coughs> mom, you know, from some website the next year, we're not going to be able to remember her, we're not going to be able to tell her what she bought for her mom a year ago. And that's actually the example that's often given, is, you know, we, we need to be able to, um, uh, un to see our repeat customers because they want to know what it is that they've bought in the past. Is that a sufficient reason for retaining all this information? You know, that's um, certainly up for debate. And clearly the retention of information has become, you know, part of the national security discussion. But I'm not, I'm not going to approach that. I think, so I do think retention is an issue. Um, but one of the, 
I mean, when I think about big data and I think about profiles, the problem really isn't around retention of the original information. It doesn't take very long to analyze the kind of purchases that, for instance, Target was analyzing or others were analyzing to make pretty accurate predictions about health conditions. So I'm not sure that retention issues really get to the type of profiling that happens in a big data context. That would be my concern about focusing too much on retention. But it's a really interesting question, and you know, I'd be interested in what everybody thinks about it. Joel, let me ask one more student-looking person before I turn to you. <laughs> I, I'm, I said that because I don't, I'm not sure you're a student, but go ahead. Uh, so kind of as a devil's advocate, could you explain what the problem is with having no control at all on collection? but very tight control on the use. I mean, if somebody, if a company knows something about me, but can't use it in a way that's offensive, what is the harm in that? So that's a great question. That's a great question, and a lot of people ask that. A lot of people who are focused on saying we should be, we should be moving entirely to a use limitation or use restriction regime here in the United States. I don't know. I'll be honest with you, my view is I don't want a data broker to know what my health conditions are. I don't think, it, what you, data brokers, credit reporting agencies have all suffered from security breaches. Every company that holds data is the, a potential victim for a security breach, as some of the people in this room know much better than I do from a technological perspective. So that information could be subject to a breach. And I don't know, why do we want companies making predictions about our health condition, even if they're just holding on to it? To me, that gets to the point I was trying to raise in my talk. I think it goes right to the heart of what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be an autonomous person, and to, to, to be able to understand you know, that my, my health information, or maybe information about my financial condition, or maybe information about my sexual orientation, whatever it is, but once you're in one of these sensitive conditions, that there aren't going to be a bunch of people out there having this information, whatever it is that they're doing with it, just sitting on it. To me, I think that it really gets to the heart of what it means to be a citizen and an autonomous person in this society. Now, not everybody's going to agree with that, but I think that that's an important part of the debate that we need to have. Sure, yeah, yeah, and then we'll get to Joel. So. You don't look like a student, though. Uh, so poor Joel. Well, I, I try to keep learning. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, I had two questions. Sure. I don't know that they're quite related. The first is I have some trouble reconciling <coughs> de identification and reclaim your name because I don't know how you reclaim your name if you're not using personally identifiable information. Sure, sure. Um, and the second part of that is that the whole updating of records things seems to me to be much more beneficial to the data brokers than right. individuals. Right. And to me, it's a, it's a complete subsidy or free marketing for that business uh, because what they're concerned about is currency <coughs> records and data quality. And it's really, I'd be very skeptical that the number of corrections that help the consumer comes close to the commercial benefit. Those are great questions. Those are great questions. So let me take them one at a time, um, although they are related. So when I talk about de-identification and the need to focus on de-identification, I'm talking about the big data analytics projects that don't really need individual information. So you know, if you're trying to, to look at traffic patterns, if you're trying to look at broader health issues, you know, everybody uses the Google flu example, but there are lots and lots of examples out there. I don't think you need ident uh, uh, linkable information, and that's where I think the call that we have made at the Federal Trade Commission and that others make to, as much as possible, move to de-identified information, I think that's where it becomes the ro most robust and the most uh, important. But what I, what I was trying to say earlier is um, de-identification won't work in a data broker context because they're creating profiles about individuals. De-identification is meaningless because that's the whole point of the data broker project or enterprise. So uh, while de-identification is important and I think that we need to move towards that as much as possible and um, you know, as, get as good as we can, it's only focused on a portion of the entire big data world, big data analytical world. 
So Reclaim Your Name is focused on that other portion, the portion where you're talking about data brokers or en other entities that have profiles about individuals, where de-identification is, is, is not part of the, the conversation. So just to make that clear, if that wasn't clear before, so that's very helpful. Okay. The second part, I actually think you're, you're, you're right, and I do have deep concerns about that, as do others. So um, I believe what you're referring to is, for instance, Axiom on its aboutthedata.com portal. Let's consumers see some information, some, some, it's marketing information only. It's not information that's used for eligibility dis determinations. And you can go in and you can see some of it. You don't see all, I believe you're not seeing all of it. And the first thing most people notice is that most of it is wrong which is frightening because you sort of think, oh gosh, they have all sorts of other uses for information that's much more substantive. Is all that information wrong too? Axiom has assured me, no, 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 these are separate databases and you're just seeing the marketing stuff. Okay, so you go in there and you see it. Like I saw um, my income was much lower than it actually is and I think it said I was single and I'm, it's, it had a, a race or ethnicity that was totally wrong for me. And your initial react, my initial reaction was to start to correct it. Right? So, well, that's not right. That's not right. And then, because I've been doing this for a really long time, I thought, gee, no, maybe I don't want to correct this. So what Axiom has said to me, what their general counsel has said to me, with whom I'm friends, and I've spoken a lot to her, to her and to the company about their portal, is um, they actually believe that this self-correcting mechanism will help make their database much more accurate than anyone, any other data broker's database, and that they are... Um, uh, all the self-corrected information will supersede any other information that they receive. So if it comes in from another source and contradicts what a consumer has said about whatever, their race, their income, whatever, the consumer's self-corrected information will always supersede, which I find really interesting. So what some academics have said is that it's, it's really a mechanism for consumers to participate in their own profiling and isn't that a problem. I, and that seems to be the implication of your question. And I think that we, you know, you do want to be thinking, you want to think about that. But again, to the extent that this information is used for marketing purposes and to the extent that you care about whether you're identified as someone who likes fishing versus liking dogs or, you know, you've bought, you like camping equipment versus something else, you go in there and correct it and you'll get the kind of ads that you want to see as opposed to the ads that you may not want to see. But, you know, it, it's, it's a... Um, debate that each of us would have to have with ourselves, and I came out not wanting to correct the information. And you may come out not wanting to correct the information. But I think at least consumers should know how they're being categorized, even to the extent that it's for marketing purposes. But most importantly, sorry, most importantly, consumers should have the right to suppress the information so that none of it is used. And Axiom does give consumers that right. Last time I was on the portal, which was around when it first came out, it was not easy to figure out how to suppress the information and I think they've they told me they were going to work to make that more prominent so um, I'd like that to be um, you know obvious to consumers that you can just suppress it which I think is an important uh, option too so so you had a question yeah I guess it dovetails very nicely with the what you just said uh -huh. beyond essentially asking consumers to help sharpen their tracking information that they already have what is the incentive for a company to voluntarily participate in Reclaim Your Name or something like that? Why should a company get involved? Great question. Um, I would say that if company, I'd say two reasons, at least two reasons. Um, I may think of a third while I'm talking. Um, I think one reason is because, again, to the extent that companies want big data analytics to thrive, and I think many of them do, they're going to have to address some of these consumer trust issues. They absolutely, ha in my view, absolutely have to. And I I'm not alone in this. I mean, people like um, Brad Smith, the general counsel of Microsoft, who's been here and who's spoken here and who's a friend of mine, also a Princeton alum, has said the same thing. The gentleman who runs WPP, the one of the world's largest ad uh, advertising companies, online advertising companies, has said the same thing. Uh, Verizon, very high executives up in, in Verizon and other telecom companies have said the same thing. So I think companies are recognizing that they've got that 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 they've got to get privacy right. They've got to figure this out. So I think that's one 
incentive. I think another incentive, frankly, is if companies don't step up to the plate, right. I think they could face legislation and regulation. And I think that what they're going to need, what I think they ought to do, is come forward and say, we get it. We get it, guys. We're going to try to solve some of these issues. Legislation may or may not be needed. So I think that's a second incentive. May I ask as a follow-up? It's great, I, sure. I guess you mentioned Microsoft, you mentioned Verizon, but I didn't know what Axiom was until after you mentioned it during the talk, and I'm sure there are a billion other companies that are secretly trading my data that I have no clue yes, they exist. I don't exactly. care about their reputation. I can't hold them accountable for whatever they may or may not have. Precisely. That's my deep concern about these companies is they're not consumer facing. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody understands. Uh, uh, the amount of information they have. And that's one of my concerns about having what I'll call single company portals. You know, there are data brokers out there that provide tools to consumers. Um, there's a lot of very, very large companies that are involved in this space. And they provide some tools to consumers, but unless you know who they are and you know to go to their website, you'd never be able to interface with any of these tools. That's one of the chief problems is they're not consumer facing. Great questions. OK, Joel, jump in. So I want to ask you an institutional question. Sure. Um, you mentioned in the talk about the FTC <coughs> being essentially the privacy regulator in the United States. And I wonder if you would comment on the strengths and weaknesses of the FTC fulfilling that role. Uh, and I think it's it, in setting the context for it, only about 10% of the FTC enforcement actions over the last 10 years have addressed data sharing or disclosure violations. About 50% of them are data security problems, and another quarter are surreptitious collection problems. The big data issues you were addressing were largely, I would call them on the sharing and use side, okay. which thus far has only been a small piece of what the FTC has, has brought in enforcement action. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about how you would see the FTC, its strengths and weaknesses for being a an enforcer and a regulator in the space? Those are, that's a great question. I mean, again, you know, we're one of, we're a very important part of the enforcement regime. And um, as you know, uh, because you've analyzed what the European data protection authorities do, you know, they, um, a lot of people think they have great laws on, on paper. I mean, if you read the laws, they, they look good and they look strong. But um, my view is that um, a law is only as good as, as its enforcement regime. And so I think it is incredibly important to be thinking about enforcement and how strong it is. Um, I, I think that we, as I said, I think we have pretty good tools for enforcement, particularly in sensitive areas, like, as you know, because you're an expert in this, Children's online privacy protection. You know, we've got a very strong regime under COPPA dealing with children's information, I think. Um, HIPAA, the Health in, uh, Information Privacy and Portability Act, I think I got that right, uh, what it stands for. Um, maybe portability and privacy, I forget which is which, but any, whatever. HIPAA um, is, I think, uh, pretty good and protective in the uh, context in which it applies. So it applies with respect to doctors, with respect to hospitals, with respect to insurance companies, that is, entities that are, quote unquote, covered entities, that, uh, you know, as the statute defines them. The problem is when you're dealing with this kind of sensitive information outside of these contexts that Congress has already identified, there's also a law dealing with financial information when it's held by financial institutions, right? But but payday, but are, are those who offer up payday loans, I'm not sure that they're considered financial institutions. Uh, websites that you go to to look at, like, gosh, I, I'm itching on my tummy, what does that mean, whether it's WebMD or something else like that, that's not a HIPAA-protected uh, uh, site, and the information that you give to that website is not HIPAA-protected. So. We as a society, I mean, if, if you look at what Congress has done over the past X number of years, we have identified already sensitive categories of information through our laws. But unfortunately, in my view, when those laws were created, I don't think anyone thought about what this technological explosion would be like. And so I think those laws are a little bit, in my view, too narrowly defined in terms of what are the covered entities and what is the nature of the financial information or, or health information that we're going to be concerned about. 
So, okay. But it, so institutionally, I think that we do have good tools. I think that to a certain extent, it's the, um, the nature of the specific laws for these sensitive areas, um, the sensitive type of information. But what Joel knows, but many of you may not know, is the FTC also has a very broad remedial law, which is called Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. And what it prohibits is unfair and deceptive acts and practices in commerce. And that's as broad as it sounds. Um, we, we are restricted from dealing with certain segments like utilities and others, but, and, and banks. Um, but we can, we can go across a pretty wide swath of the economy uh, and focus on um, data collection and use practices that could be deemed either deceptive or unfair. So when I, I haven't looked at your data, I would be very interested in it. I would say that 10 years is a little bit too long of a, of a time span to look at to develop for the percentages you're developing. I would be much more interested in what has happened over the past, say, four or five years and where those percentages lie. Because I think, first of all, that's when mobile has exploded. That's when all of these online services and whatnot have exploded. And I think if you were to look at those trends, you would probably see an increased use of our unfairness jurisdiction, an increased use of our examining uh, data collection and use practices as opposed to security practices. And um, you know, we, we will use those you know, when we see a problem, a, a real problem in terms of what's ha what a particular company is, is doing, we will use our unfairness or our deception jurisdiction as appropriate. So that's a long-winded response to a very uh, interesting question, which I'm sure you're writing a paper about. And I'll be very <laughs> eager to see it. And we can chat about that some more <laughs> offline. So yeah, uh, yeah, you in front, then you right behind. Um, how do your solutions account for changes to sensitivities with privacy, um, right. particularly related to age, because for one generation, posting your dog root is a horrifying idea, but for another, it's a common everyday practice. Which, what is a common everyday practice for? Like posting your dog root. Oh, your dog, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. ran three and a half yep, yep. 30 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. And I mean, especially with something like changing the law, and you just mentioned we as a society, that conversation in society has different demographic aspects to that, and creating a law, at least in this Congress, is incredibly difficult. And so changing that law would be difficult as well. I mean, how do you account for that changing demographic and these solutions that you propose? So I think that's a great, that all these are great questions, and that's an additional great question. Um, you know, um, the sort of uh, meme that's out there is that younger generations who are much more technologically savvy don't care as much about privacy and they're much more willing to share. I do think they're much more willing to share, but I don't think it's true when you look at the underlying data that, uh, that young kids don't care about privacy. I think one of the issues is that they haven't yet come up against like an employer telling them, oh, gee, you know, I found something on your, you know, social media uh, site, your, your page, and I want to ask you about that. Or can you give me access to your social media page because I'm thinking of hiring you, but I want to check out what you've done. You know, once people start facing those kinds of um, issues, I think then privacy takes on a completely different meaning. And when you look at some of the research that's out there about um, social, uh, about opinions, you know, broken up by age brackets, when you do a deep dive into that, you see that young kids do care about privacy. They are much more technologically savvy. That's absolutely true. And you know what your jogging route is. You know, e even I, an oldster, I don't care about that. I'm happy to let people know, although it's a little embarrassing because I don't, I don't do go that far. But that's okay. But you know, I, but I don't think that's going to have. I can't imagine what the effect of that would be. Although, frankly, in a big data analytics world, it could have an effect. It could have an effect on some predictions that might be made about me. But I think I, I think that kids, and I say kids, I mean young people, young adults, do really care about privacy. When you look at the data, it's quite it's quite clear that they do. So I think the meme about that isn't isn't quite um, accurate when you do a deeper dive. Sure, it's okay, sure. Just a quick question. Uh, sure. Does that research on like opinion translate to how they act? So I mean they may say one thing. Always research, a great question. Always is that how they're acting in real life. Always a great question. I mean, there are lots of studies being done about how much people interact with the privacy tools that are given to them, right? On whether it's Facebook or elsewhere. So that's a great question. Um, I think a 
different issue than the political issue that I think you were raising, because I think opinions do matter there, perhaps more in the political context. But it's a great question. Yes? I, I have a terrible question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sex, all right? Money, drugs. You get everybody's attention. Yeah. Everybody's looking at me. I get everybody's attention, okay? That's what you were talking about from yep. there, Julie, and, and, and it's fascinating. Um, and you're talking about Target, and you're talking about Verizon, you're talking about a big data broker like Axiom or First Data. That, I, I get that. I didn't mention First Data. No, you didn't. But, <laughs> but I know. Them. Using them it's to I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry the, for the, interrupting. The, the, uh, the business that I owned for many years was a small business. We had less than 100 employees. We tried to attract people, use, the bane of my existence was uh, the database, the marketing list, the getting people to come to your, to, there are SMBs all over the country, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. Yeah. They're trying to attract customers and they're trying to compete with Dunkin' Donuts, they're trying to compete with Burger they're trying right. to compete with all of these places. They need as much of that data to be competitive as they can. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that any law that is passed is going to be a one-size-fits-all. I won't use any examples of one-size-fits-all things that have passed in the last, oh, let's say 10 years, but they do. And, and uh, you know, how is this going to impact the small business person right. who doesn't have 50 or 100 attorneys Right. or a billion dollar legal budget to be able to in, you know, interpret and then put it into, into place? I'll still give that a good question. <laughs> I'll still say, no, 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 or it's a great question. Okay, so, he, so um, a couple of different thoughts about that. Um, and and that's is, that issue is raised in Washington. Um, a lot of industry groups say, you're calling for data broker legislation. There's thousands and thousands of entities that could be defined as a data broker, depending upon how you define it. And you, know, you really can't set up a regime that's going to regulate the big guys in the same way as the small guys. OK. Um, that's actually not what I'm calling for. I, I, I think that there's a way to define data brokers in a, much more narrowly. Um, you know, as entities that are selling profiles, for instance, um, as opposed to entities that are using them. I mean, again, this would be a start if you, if you start down the path of at least trying to control some of this information to the extent that it's part of the, a commercial transaction, I think we can do that. Also, if you look at the credit reporting laws, the credit reporting laws are, are our credit reporting regime is actually quite broad and quite robust. Yet we have developed Congress has developed and rules have been written around um, additional steps that must be taken by entities that are known as the national credit reporting agencies that have a, world, a, a, a national footprint. And I think we could take the very, that very same idea and say, okay, for you data brokers that are really big and you recognize that you, you are in this business, you're going to have to take additional steps. We've done it in the credit reporting area, and I think we can do it in the, um, in the data broker area. So I don't think, I mean, because one of the things that is often said by industry is, you know, this is too big. It's too big a problem to solve. And I'd like to turn that around and really let those who are saying that look in the mirror and bounce it back at them. If it's a huge problem, we must solve it. Maybe we do it step by step. <laughs> But it, it is a huge problem, and there are lots of folks who, who are dealing in this information, and they need to become aware of it. Now, there's one other thing I just want to say real quick, and that's, yeah, there are a lot of small, you know, the data broker enterprise can be done by very, very small entities because the cost of doing analytics, the cost of storing data, and the amount of data that's out there has created a perfect storm allowing for this to happen by smaller and smaller entities. You no longer need to have IBM's Watson in order to do big data analytics. But if you're a small firm and you're dealing with highly sensitive information, you know, like you said, sex, drugs, and rock and roll or whatever, you know, I, I think there's a responsibility, no matter what your size is in terms of the size of your company, if you're dealing in health information, creating and selling health information, I think you need to recognize that that's deeply sensitive and that it needs to be controlled in some fashion. Absolutely. 
that's why that's why I brought that up first. I'm talking about people that are simply trying to find out yep. who likes to drink coffee, okay, so that they can send them a message to their mobile phone. Um, or in my case, who is it that is going to be attending conferences so that I can get them to maybe attend my conference too? Okay, it has nothing to do with that. I'm concerned about the collateral damage of people saying sex, drugs, and 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 money is right. going to is going to be, you know, is the problem and it gets everybody's attention. So those small and medium enterprises are customers of data brokers. They're using this information. Um, I don't think what I'm talking about is targeting them so much as the entities that are providing them with these lists. But we can talk some more about that. Yeah, back there. So, uh, oh, you already, I'm sorry, go, go right ahead, but you've already asked a question. Yeah, sorry. Um, one more question. So you've created these classes of data that are sensitive. But in the example of target, that data is derived from data that is not sensitive. Correct, absolutely. And if you allow the storage of non-sensitive data, somebody getting that data either through a commercial purpose or through hacking could always re-derive the sensitive parts in the same way. Yep. So is it enough to control these sensitive areas? It's uh, a bit, that's what I've been talking about. That's one of the problems. Right. So let's go, did someone else, yeah, right there. Yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to sort of the data, or the, these big data brokers sure. and who they are. And I want to reiterate the point that I had no idea that these firms existed until today. I'll and give you guys a list. The Facebook <laughs> and Target. Um, I'm interested in why you think opt out is the best strategy for consumers. If you want these companies to be consumer facing, why not put the burden on them to meet the consumers, explain to them why it's safe for them to share their data, why it's advantageous to them, and force these companies who are have plenty of money and resources to do that work rather than putting the work on the consumer <coughs> to figure out who they are, what's going on, is it safe, is it not, at what level is it? It's, it why, why have the consumer do that work and not these, these companies? So my heart is with you, but I'm a political realist. I mean, I mean, that's just the very, very quick answer. I mean, I'm often talking to the advertising industry. You know, I say, I say to them, you know, they can do much. They don't need, you know, they, the full-blown privacy notices that they use um, are important. They need to be out there so that analysts, uh, uh, scholars, technologists can look at, do a deep dive into the practices that companies are engaged in. But, you know, these are entities that are really good at, telling consumers in very, with very, with pictures and graphics and icons what they want consumers to know. They could do the same thing about, with respect to privacy. So I completely understand where you're coming from. Companies should have to convince consumers, and they have the tools to convince consumers um, uh, that, that what they're doing is the right thing. But, um, but I really do think that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think that if we, if we do push for an opt-in regime, it's just not going to happen. I mean, that's what I mean by being a political realist. And frankly, I also think that there's some issues around, um, uh, you know, opt-out, while not the same as opt-in, um, can actually provide a lot of information. You know, if people like Ed can find out what's going on with, with information collection and use, people like Ashkan Sultani and other technologists can find this stuff out. Even in an opt-out regime, it can be very, very helpful and provide a lot of sunshine and disinfectant in, in this ecosystem. Perhaps we, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure, sure. So you, and then you. Did you ask a question yet? No. no. Okay, great. Yeah. So I wanted to bring the discussion back really concretely to the FTC and sure. the enforcement regime sure. again and talk about, you mentioned in your talk that there's been a lot of data security enforcement. Yes. Um, and I'm curious whether you guys see that having a deterrent effect in the industry because it seems like there's still uh, quite a lot of data breaches, even really big ones, even at companies where you would think they have, say, a big enough uh, legal and compliance team that they could do things correctly, but they, they just don't seem to care. That's another great question. Um, I do think that our enforcement regime uh, 
uh, does provide incentive for companies to, to get their act together. I mean, imagine what it would be like if we weren't doing any enforcement. Um, so, and, and when we do our data security cases, we are not seeking perfect security. I mean, on, there'd be technologists, those of you who are technologists in the room would say there's no such thing as perfect security. We're not even telling companies that they violate the unfair and deceptive acts and practices portion of the FTC Act if they don't have super uh, 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 security. What we're looking for is reasonable security. And the companies that we go after with respect to data security problems often had been warned about the problem or their, the problem that they faced that led to a big, a, a big breach or may or may not have led to a big breach um, uh, is something that's like well known and easily solvable. Those are the kinds of cases that we tend to bring. Not the cases where someone failed to re read the very latest blog post by some you know, obscure technologist and didn't act on it within two days. Those are not the cases that we bring. So yes, I, I actually think we do provide an incentive for industry as a whole, for businesses to, to deal with uh, uh, cybersecurity and data security. And there are some other incentives out there. I mean, look, these are businesses that are often, that often are consumer facing, not all of them, but often are. And, you know, the consumer trust issues are huge for them as well. And that, I think, that market force also uh, is a huge incentive for many companies. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, the opt-out strategy, would you leave that um, in the hands of all of the data brokers, so that each data broker would have its own opt-out, or would you rather have a single unified portal for that? And if you'd rather have a unified place, you know, where you do all the opting out and seeing your data, would you be concerned that that would introduce a greater security issue? Because instead of being multiple data brokers, each one having some information, <coughs> instead of one repository with all of the data brokers. Yeah, that's that's very also very insightful. Um, I think from a consumer uh, usability perspective, it would be much easier to have a, a single opt-out. But I do think that some of those security concerns have been raised when I discuss this with industry. And I do just dis have discussed it with a lot of different industry players. And they do raise that very issue. So for instance, you know, each data broker may have different information. Um, some may have your income, some may not. And if you, if it's sort of all dealt with as one, then you may actually be passing information to a data broker that didn't have that information before. So you're raising some really important issues, um, which is why what I'm calling for right now, again, in an ideal world, you know, maybe I would want it from, again, from consumer usability to be a single choice mechanism. But at least right now, what I'm calling for is one place where consumers can go so that they can find out what options they have. They might have to then, you know, visit several different data brokers, which is going to be incredibly cumbersome, but at least it's one place to go. So instead of having to know that Axiom exists, or Merkle exists, or Epsilon exists, or any of our first data exists, oh, the gentleman left, but, you know, any of these individual companies exist, and, you know, you've never heard of them, you would never be able to find them, there's one portal where you can go to at least see who the major brokers are. So, but you're raising an issue that um, actually, you know, experts in the ind industry have also raised. So thank you. This was really great. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.